Economic sanctions against Russia appear to be backfiring around the world. Is this a good strategy to end the conflict in Ukraine? Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Beginning of the crisis in Ukraine, the U.S., Canada, Europe, and a few nations in Asia slapped economic sanctions on Moscow. Russia became the most sanctioned country in the world. It was an attempt to cut off resources needed to maintain Russia's military campaign in Ukraine. That was in March. Four months later, the conflict is still going on and economic pains are being felt around the world. And some experts are saying it could have been worse if more countries actually joined in the economic embargo against Russia. Earlier, I spoke with Yukon Yuan, senior fellow in the Carnegie Asia program. For all of us here in the United States, gasoline prices are higher, heating oil prices are higher. Coal prices are the highest in 50 years now. Coal, okay? We were trying to push it aside. Now it's basically zoomed up there as an alternative. So energy prices, oil and gas is a big issue. And this, in some people's minds, is the crucial issue in the Ukraine. Can the West stop buying energy from Russia and if they could do so, would that mean that Russia would not have the financial resources to continue its military campaign? So that is the big issue. And then where does Asia come into this? So now you see a series of articles which basically say, we have a problem because if Russia no longer able to sell to Europe and others, but it can sell to India and it can sell to China, and this offsets its sale to Europe, then Asia is not helpful, okay? So there's going to be, and there will continue to be, a lot of, again, recriminations of blame for Asia not supporting the Western Alliance's embargo on oil. So I'm writing an article on this. My headline actually is, this doesn't make any sense at all, okay? If you are the Western Alliance, you should ask Asia to buy this oil. Why is that? That's so obvious, okay? But right now, they're basically saying to the West, excuse me, saying to China, India, stop buying. Russian oil. You're hurting our effort. Okay? So let's ask what would happen if China and India said, okay, I'm not going to buy this Russian oil, even though it's being discounted, it's very, very convenient, but I still need a lot of oil. Okay? So what will I do? What they'll do is China will go to its second largest source. Right now, Russia is a major source of oil going into China. It's in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. Okay. Now, what is European doing? Europe is no longer buying Russian oil. It's actually going to the Middle East. Oil prices today are very high. Conservative estimates are that they would double. Double today's prices. That would be untenable. You'd have total chaos and breakdown of governments. Biden would totally lose the election because people would say this is ridiculously irresponsible. So here's the interesting thing. If China and India actually supported, honored the Western alliance and bargaining purchases of oil, the Western governments would all collapse. And they don't see that. So what is the second best choice? Well, here's what the, really, the West is trying to do. Europe wants to reduce its dependency on Russia for energy in order to give it more freedom to sort of like implement foreign policies in a way that's neutral or, or not, not having to be forced to do something because Russia is, is the main source. So that, I think, is a legitimate objective. And therefore, Europe needs to diversify its energy away from Russia. That the, should be the dominant objective. But you want to do that in a way that does not create global energy prices which are untenable. So that means that the Russian oil, which is no longer sold to Europe, needs to be made available to somebody else. Because if you don't, that somebody else is going to be based, trying to buy the same oil that Europe is trying to buy. So the real point here is people don't realize it. The fact that Asia is buying this oil has actually made the oil prices higher. I mean, the prices are higher for different reasons, not because of the Ukraine war, but they've been not as high as they could have been if, in fact, they stopped buying. But, but uh, everything you just said makes perfect sense. How come there aren't people in meetings saying, hey, wait a minute, if we do this, what, where are those people, those voices? Here it is. We're driven by security people. The security people don't understand or care about what I call the economics of oil. I'm an economist. 
So oil, if it's not sold to one person, it will be sold to another one. Oil is a global commodity. There's a global price. So you stop it here, it'll show up there. You can't, you can't affect it by segmenting markets. We know that from the past, okay? So I look at it, I say to myself, gee, you're going to say, you could say, Europe doesn't want to buy Russia's oil. Russia is a major producer of global oil. So if, if Russia is unable to sell this oil, global supplies will basically be so short that it's untenable. Everybody would basically be able, running into a rationing or they'd have riots. So what you want to do then is to make that available, oil available as cost efficiently, as cheaply as possible so that global supplies are not totally disrupted. Okay? Now, when you do that, you realize, of course, that Russia still is able to sell oil and financially keep up. So that's the second objective. The second objective basically is to weaken Russia financially. So here's my point. We know in economics or actually in, in politics, you have multiple objectives. You can't use one vehicle for it. So your basically oil embargo solves the first one. Europe is no longer as dependent upon Russia, and that's good. But you can't at the same time weaken Russia financially because Russia's got to sell that oil. And if it doesn't, the world is going to collapse, actually, because of the oil shortage, OK? Then the issue will be, what do I want to do about Russia's financial position and weakening it in the long term? And the answer to that is, that will happen, but it'll take a long time. It'll happen because they're not investing yet. They can't get high-tech commodities. They're being cut off from foreign investment, et cetera, et cetera. So their, their growth rate is going to fall by 10% this year, another 10% next year. So it's going to take two or three years, but you're not going to solve the problem in six months. In six months or, eight, or six months, you can sort of like solve this problem about Europe dependency, but not Russia financial weakening. All right. Okay? And that's the problem because everyone would like to see a simple solution. The whole interview with Yukon Yuong will air in an upcoming edition of our show, Full Frame. To continue our discussion about the sanctions against Russia, let's bring in our panelist from Bloomington, Indiana. Michael Alexeyev is a professor of economics at Indiana University. Here in Washington, D.C., Yvonne Eland is a senior fellow and director of the Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. And Dushar Gupta is a senior editor at Sawarja. He is joining us from New Delhi. Welcome to the show. And Tushar, why don't I start with you? You just heard Yukon Yuong saying, you know, basically China and India are doing what's in their best self-interest, but they may actually be helping the West in the long run because these oil prices could skyrocket even higher. I want to get your take on his thoughts. In the early days of the invasion, say the first few days of March, there was the question if Indians would like to import cheap Russian oil. Because the budgeting that we had done in this year's financial year for oil was around $70 to $75 a barrel. But as a result of the invasion, it shot up to $120, $130, with some analysts saying it could reach $200. Now, as a country, as a $3 trillion economy, as a nation of 1.3 billion people, we have our economic interests to cater. And while there were a lot of commentators, analysts, many from Washington, D.C., who were not very fond of the idea that India is pushing for more Russian oil, this is what made sense to us in the larger game. In the last year, if I give you an example, the percentage of oil we were importing from Russia was less than 1%, if I talk on a daily basis. This year, in this month, the June, that is, it has already reached 20%. So cheap oil is important for a V-shaped recovery, especially after the pandemic, for economies around the globe, starting with the big economies, which includes ours, China's, America, even European economy for that matter, it's important that they are not disrupted by rising oil prices. But instead, what are the Americans wanting of us? That we should give up on the idea of cheap barrel, that we should go for 130, 140 barrel, which will in turn hurt our economic recovery. So I think for, by going for Russian oil, of course, the Russians have also found a new market in China and India. But in the larger sum game, it makes more economic sense than anything else. Uh, good point. Um, Ivan, let me ask you about U.S. President Biden. He's heading to Saudi Arabia uh, in the middle of this month. It's an effort to actually try and get the country to produce more oil, bring down the price of, of oil. Uh, you suggest this probably is not the best strategy, uh, and you suggest another. Can you, can you kind of elaborate? Well, I think, you know, we've kind of overstated the Saudis' ability to affect the uh, oil price in the, in the medium and the long term. And, um, you know, I guess it doesn't hurt for him to go there, but there's no real reason to, to uh, 
you know, push Saudi Arabia to do that because it's in the, it will be in their best interest when the price is so high. And in fact, all producers to put as much oil in the market as they can. But I think they they have uh, production uh, constraints. I think there are refining constraints, certainly in the United States and and probably other places, maybe in Asia as well. So I'm not sure it's really going to work. Uh, the economist that you just had on, I think, is really right to sum it up. Oil is a worldwide commodity, and if you put oil on the market, you know, the price is going to go down. If you take oil off the market, it's going to go up. But there's no, there's going to be a lot of evasion of the Russian sanctions. And, of course, they just, as it was just mentioned, uh, Russia discounts its, its supply, so people can't pass up the chance to get some Oil and natural gas might be a little bit different uh, since it's more of a regional market at this point. Uh, when liquid natural gas gets more, you know, common, you may have a worldwide market like the oil. But so sanctions on natural gas might have some more of economic effect. But we have to remember with economic sanctions, uh, these are also political. And a lot of economists forget about the political aspects. It, it's a it's an economic means to a political end. And oftentimes, when you put sanctions on, it doesn't have, especially when you're asking something big like withdraw from, from Russian withdrawal from Ukraine, it doesn't happen. Sanctions can sometimes coerce people to do, or I should say, people or regimes to do something, uh, you know, easy or small, but not big. The, the main thing, the one area where sanctions could really have an effect is. Tech web, direct weapons technology, if you can shut that off. And that's a much more oligopolistic market. And uh, the other thing you have to do is uh, sanctions can cause economic pain, especially in the long term, as was already mentioned. But the real thing that the Ukrainians have to do is beat them on the battlefield. And I think the West is, uh, you know, trying to help out there with uh, direct weapons shipments. Well, and a black uh, weapons uh, technology to Russia. Right. Michael, let me ask you about the sanctions. Uh, initially, uh, we saw the ruble tank. Uh, foreign multinational companies were pulling out. The economic prospects appeared grim. Uh, the West was trumpeting this as a huge success. But then now the ruble is the world's strongest performing currency. So, so what happened? Was the Kremlin just insulated uh, for this? Uh, were they prepared? How do you describe the sanctions? Well, I think the sanctions are working to some extent and not working to another extent. I agree with previous speakers that it wouldn't make that much sense uh, to stop Russia exporting oil. I think the sanctions are already helping in terms of reducing the Russian revenues because they have to sell oil at a discount to India and China. Uh, but I. So as far as the ruble strength is concerned, it is very strong, but it is actually hurting Russia because it is strong for a wrong reason. It is strong because Russia basically stopped its imports largely, and it still has exports. So it has a lot of, of hard currencies here so coming in and, and nothing to buy with it. So basically, the Russian businesses do not need dollars because they can't import anything. And that's why the ruble is strong. And the reason it is hurting, especially the Russian government, is because the Russian government, it has its budget in rubles. When the ruble is strong, when it sells its oil for, say, $100 a barrel, it translates into a lot fewer rubles than it used to. And uh, that creates some problems for the Russian budget. But let me mention something I think very important about the sanctions. I agree that, so again, cutting off the Russian exports of oil and gas completely is not a good idea. But what would be a very good idea is stopping the Russian ability to import anything, not only the military stuff, but anything. Uh, right now, just to give you one example, uh, the Russian car production has fallen by 97 percent in the, in the month of May. It's because they cannot import the uh, well, spare parts. Um, and if the West could have this kind of embargo on the exports to Russia, it would hurt the Russian economy a lot more, and it would hurt the Russian ability to 
to produce and repair the weapons to conduct the war. Tushar, I saw you uh, shaking your head. Do you want to say something? See, the whole idea behind sanctioning Russia comes across as a very confused one. If you look at it from a third party perspective, which in this case, India happens to be one. What is President Joe Biden's eventual goal when it comes to Russia? Is it hurting the Russian economy? It's not working. Is it sanctioning the Russian economy? It's not visible. Inflation is a problem which is globally. But look at the magnitude of inflation in the United States right now. Compare it with the magnitude of inflation in India right now. We don't have a prime minister, even with some increased petrol prices across India, tweeting that the gas stations need to price the crude in a certain way. But Joe Biden is doing that. You look at Europe, it's staring at a long winter. There is rationing going on in Germany. Now, if the eventual end goal of sanctions was to deter Russia from furthering their advances in Ukraine, that has not worked. But what do we have instead? We have Europeans struggling for natural gas and crude. We have American president tweeting about inflation at the gas stations and people making a mockery out of it. So at the end of the day, the larger question needs to be asked, have the sanctions worked? And the second point, it could easily be debated that did India really need to go for Russian crude? After all, they just made up for less than 1% of our crude in the last year when it comes to imports. But the important point, which President Biden doesn't seem to realize is that oil prices going up will hurt the global economic recovery after the pandemic which is going to hurt the U.S. as well. It's imperative for the global economies to work together on the recovery after the pandemic. But increased oil prices do not work for, well for anyone. And point number three, I disagree with the last speaker when he says that we can make sure that Russian imports are completely debarred or we stop uh, countries from exporting anything to Russia, even if be car spare parts. This is where we are going to invariably strengthen the Russian-Chinese axis. The Russians have already approached China when it comes to selling their crude. They can also approach them when it comes to other small products. China is indeed the factory of the world. China is already importing more EVs to Europe, for example. So tomorrow there is a clear chance, a clear possibility that China may take over that position, which the American companies have vacated in the early weeks of Feb and March. All right. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Michael, uh, I want to give you a chance to respond to what he just said. But, but before you do, uh, it kind of leads me to a question I was going to ask about a recent uh, Bloomberg report, which says that there are unnamed Biden administration officials who are privately expressing concerns about the sanctions. They feel like uh, it really isn't changing the behavior of the Kremlin. Uh, the penalties are increased uh, inflation, a worsening food insecurity, and, and it's also pun punishing uh, ordinary Russians. So there are already some rumors within the Biden administration that, that they're not really even happy with the results. I, I want to ask you, are the, are, is this basically an effort to change behavior? Is it a, an effort to just punish uh, Putin? Or is it basically a domestic message to, to the audience here in the United States? Hey, we're, we're getting tough on Russia. Well, the goal of sanctions in the short term is to impede the Russian the ability of Russia to make weapons and repair weapons in the longer term, it is to essentially uh, to punish, I guess. Uh, but the sanctions are not working until they are working, and they will work. Now, inflation in Russia is a lot higher than it is in the U.S. and Europe. And inflation in the U.S. and Europe would have been there anyway. I just want to make sure everybody understands. The share of oil in the U.S. economy is about 3 percent. It's not a big deal. These things hurt much poorer countries, including India. But they don't really hurt America that much. And gas prices started rising in America well before the Russian invasion. So we should not blame it all on the Russian invasion. Of course, so Biden likes to do that, but it's not really true. So, and again, the the point in the short term is to prevent the Russians to be able to produce and repair weapons. Now, China has not shown that it wants to help Russia much. It has been behaving very carefully, and I hope it will continue to do so. Ivan, let me ask you about the tools of economic sanctions. Of course, they've been used before. Uh, we have examples, Iran, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea. But this is the first time a G20 uh, nation has been targeted with uh, these strict economic sanctions. In this interconnected world, uh, just to get back to earlier comments and about how, you know, you push the lever here, it impacts other parts of the world. Uh, we're all interconnected now. What's, what's the impact globally of something like this? 
Well, I think uh, in all these cases, it, you know, basically the free market works whether you put sanctions on or not. I mean, cartel, uh, saying economic sanctions are essentially a cartel. And we found out in 1973, in the late 1970s, that the OPEC cartel, uh, you know, can have a short-term effect, but in the long term, uh, the price of oil goes higher, goes back up, you know, it, it goes up and, and it comes down. And, it, and if the OPEC restricts production, it'll, it'll go up for a while, but then people will start cheating on the cartel because it's just in their economic interest to do that. That the, 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 And the higher price now will cause people to put more oil on the market one way or another. So I think in general, sanctions don't work and they distort the global trading patterns. Now, in this case, what they probably should have done was to realize, that, go back and look at the history of sanctions. A lot of times, as you mentioned, it's just for domestic purposes. You know, we can't just... Uh, Russia has invaded another country. You can't just slap them on the wrist with diplomacy, and you can't go to war because it'll escalate to maybe to a nuclear weapon. So you got to choose a middle ground to show that you're mad about it and that you're doing something. And that's not really an effective policy. But I think very targeted sanctions could have been put on the military for what was just mentioned, because China does not appear, uh, you know, other countries have to have technology to compete with the military technology because it's an oligopolistic. So there is a chance that they could restrict key military technologies if China just says, well, we're not going to provide that much help for, for Russia. So I think targeted uh, sanctions that go right to the military issue is probably what they should have done rather than all this other stuff. Because it's, you know, it, um, free trade means uh, or trade at all means it's a mutually beneficial transaction, right? So both parties are going to lose. If I cut off the exports to Russia, uh, the United States and, and the West, they're going to lose as well. And our other speakers are pointing out some of those, uh, you know, costs. Uh, to, Char, to that point, if uh, both sides are losing, Russia is responsible for about 20 percent of the wheat consumed around the world. We're already seeing the impacts in poorer countries in Africa and Asia, spike in food prices, uh, the absence of food on the shelves. Uh, talk to us about that issue and, and the impacts that we're seeing. See, if you have to, the Democrats, you know, from what it appears to a third party again, appears to be still in the Cold War mentality. So for them, it's very important domestically to show that, yes, we are doing something. But look at what's happening in the U.S. right now. The midterms are just a few months away, and everyone is predicting the Democrats to be decimated in the upcoming midterms. President Biden's approval ratings are at an all-time low. So clearly this mentality that we are on top of Russia, that we are getting tough on Russia, is clearly not working. Now, coming to the commodity prices, prices of some essential oils have gone up, wheat prices have gone up, and that is because of the invasion in Ukraine. There is a detailed report, rather, as to how the exports, the food exports from Ukraine are hurting countries in Africa. And India has been able to step up in some positions, especially with respect to export of wheat. We also made a case at the WTO recently where the export clauses could have been debated upon so that more food could be exported from India. But clearly, those are still processes in the making, deliberations still underway. But at this point, inflation is hurting the global economy. What concerns me more than anything is that a slow global recovery from the pandemic will hurt across the globe. It will hurt the trade, it will hurt the supply chains. China is not growing as fast as it should, especially after the COVID zero lockdowns. So coupled with inflation and the slow recovery, it will be a problem. Upon that, you have the central banks which are trying to engineer a slow, a soft landing, as they like to call it. That is also not working out because the inflation right now is so volatile. Even the central banks cannot take a very clear position. So all in all, it's a big mess, and that is where the confusion that originated from the White House is coming into question. Uh, Michael, this is a big mess that he just described. Uh, as you know, in order to make this effective, you have to stitch together a number of allies to kind of join this coalition to impose these economic sanctions, and then you don't want to see any cracks in that. But we are seeing this report from Reuters that came out today that uh, that at least an aid to uh, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, saying basically that the EU needs to really kind of take the take the foot off the gas when it comes to uh, these economic sanctions and look for a uh, ceasefire and the start of negotiations. Uh, this aid saying more sanctions will only hurt the EU bloc and Russia will survive. I want to get your sense about whether or not there are cracks in this united front and what that means long term. 
Yes, of course, there are cracks, and we could have expected that, especially from Hungary, and Germany is also well, somewhat ambivalent and all that. The sanctions are not perfect, and the sanctions are not going to win the war. But all this stuff about how the European Union is hurting, America is hurting, Remember, the Russian economy is about 2 percent of the world economy. It does not hurt the European Union and America and other at least rich countries. And Russia does not account for 20 percent of consumption of wheat or corn in the world. It may be accounting for 20 percent of exports. Uh, so a lot of these things, including the oil prices and food prices, inflation, all that started well before the Russian invasion. And we should not assign all these problems to the war. They will be there whether the war is continuing or not. It's just, it's just a matter of, of how much. So, yes, the war is adding to the price of oil, but it did not cause the oil prices to be as high as they are. So I think even with some cracks in the correlation of the sanctions, they will work, and they are not supposed to work in the short term. They will work over the years. They worked in South Africa. They worked in some sense with respect to the Soviet Union, and they will certainly work with respect to Russia, even if they are not airtight. Ivan, uh, Michael says they will work, but sanctions alone have a pretty poor record when it comes to halting military adventures during the 20th century. Uh, recent reports said three out of 19 attempts to use sanctions as a policy to impede war uh, have been successful. So why are countries still using these tactics? Because when you look at it uh, as an instrument to stop war, uh, this, the examples they show uh, where it was successful, 1921, 1925, in 1956, uh, no real success in the last 65 years or so. Yes, and one other example where they put really grinding sanctions on was Saddam Hussein after he invaded Kuwait in 1990, and they put sanctions on, eventually went to war because the sanction didn't work. And sometimes sanctions can show your, it can be an escalatory thing. Not, not only will it not stop the war, it will cause an escalation to the next level. So I think we have to be careful with using them. And as I said before, oftentimes they're a domestic, particularly in the United States, since we use sanctions the most, it's a, it's a domestic, uh, has a, the primary effect, I think, is domestically to show that the president, whatever party they're from, is actually doing something about a problem. He can't, again, he can't, get in, he refuses to, and with good reason, to get to send U.S. troops because we could have a nuclear war, potentially. And the other thing is, if you just do the diplomatic at the other end of the spectrum, that seems like you're not doing anything. So we put on sanctions. I would have preferred targeted sanctions. And I think, you know, over time, that is going to hurt the Russian economy. But I don't think there's any way that Putin is going to stop unless he's defeated on the battlefield or he gets what he wants. And I'm hoping he doesn't do that because I'm, you know, I think he did the wrong thing here. And, you know, it was counterproductive for him. Now he has true NATO troop buildup, NATO more uh, nations in NATO. And uh, Ukrainian nationalism, I think, is going to cause a guerrilla warfare for many years because they want part of their country back, you know, that, that, that's been taken. All right, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much. It was a very robust conversation. Really appreciate it. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for joining us.